Today, we are fortunate to have Jared Thatcher with us. Jared Thatcher is a CPI program manager at the Port of Seattle. He has built a lean network and other US, with other US ports, hosts the annual virtual lean summit and global lean summit, an in-person event, and coaches other lean professionals. And as an Amazon best-selling author with his book, Parenting the Lean Way. He holds a BA in Japanese from Portland State University and an international MBA from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He also is a PMP and certified scrum master. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Jared. Perfect, thank you. Share, cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you for having me. And then, uh, Jenny, just really quick, um, in order to give some time for questions, what time would you suggest I end? If you could end at uh, 9.50, we would definitely have some time for questions. Perfect. All right. Well, that means we've got a lot to cover, so we'll just go ahead and, and get into it. Um, all right. So situational leadership, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but um, to me, it is a, a great model because it really shows that connection between leadership, adjusting your style to meet your, your followers or the people that you work with um, where they're at, uh, which really does reflect that, that value of respect for people, which is what we care about within Lean. So let's move on. So what is leadership? Uh, is what the... Here, hold on. Gotta move this stuff out of the way so I can actually see my slides. There we go. So um, the agenda, we're going to cover three things. We're going to look at what is leadership. We're going to understand what the situational model, leadership model is, and then we're going to apply that model using lean. So from that perspective, what is leadership? Now, ever since uh, the the author uh, of this, this next uh, comic book strip um, made some really uh, disparaging remarks. I have chosen not to use them, but I think from this the standpoint of both the individual as well as uh, what this uh, next comic strip shows of what a leadership should not be, I think it is appropriate. So you'll forgive me for showing this, but uh, here's a Delbert uh, cartoon that says uh, we've got the boss. He's uh, showing a, a slide with the uh, sales on the downturn. It says sales are dropping right like a rock. And then he shows another slide, shows the future with the uh, sales going through the roof. And it says, um, our plan is to invent some sort of doohickey that everyone wants to buy. And then the next scene, uh, the boss is talking to Dilbert, his uh, worker, and says, okay, the visionary leadership work is done. How long will your part take? Well, this is not what we want to do. We do not want to go ahead and and put everything on our followers and, and think that we're going to be successful if, if all we do is just show the vision. So we have to be integral. We have to be working with and understand and uh, be part of it. This is a part of what Lean is all about, especially going to Gemba, which is the place where action takes uh, place. I think a much better definition of what leadership is uh, comes from Peter Drucker. And he said that uh, leadership is lifting a person's height uh, or a person's vision uh, to high sights, uh, the raising of a person's performance to a higher standard and uh, the ability of a personality beyond its normal limitations. Uh, to me, that really does highlight what we're trying to do within Lean, of, of respect for people and helping to uh, build people. And I think a good example of what leadership is comes from Toyota, where uh, they have, well, actually, I'll get to that slide in a second, but, um, you know, what's, what's important, to, I think, to understand with leadership is that we don't necessarily define what leadership is as leaders ourselves. Now, it's true that our leadership is based on a number of uh, factors. It's based on your experiences and your charisma, your talents, your skills, your competencies, and the vision that you have. However, the reality is the success as a leader is based on the followers. And so that's key because it is not you who defines what leadership truly is. Rather, it is your leadership uh, style is defined and not by you, but rather by the, the behavior that you exhibit as perceived by the followers. In other words, the followers decide what your leadership uh, style is, not what you think it is, if that makes sense. So from Toyota's perspective, 
they have this idea of we build people, not cars. Um, in fact, I was just uh, last month, I was at Toyota Material Handling uh, in Columbus, Indiana. And as we were going through their plant, they had this uh, sign up on the wall, which is that uh, they're all about making things is about making people. And that actually comes from the Japanese, which is monotsukuri wa shito tsukuri kara, or the making of things uh, is because we make the people. Okay, so what we want to do is, as lean leaders is really move away from this traditional command and control style leadership that we've we've had for you know generations. And traditional leadership is is identified by a number of different things. It's it's firefighting is rewarded, improvements are identified by management. Leadership uh, traditional leadership hides problems. It focuses on the silos. It blames uh, people or shifts blame and it blames uh, individuals for the issues. It focuses um, improvement efforts uh, on efficiency only. Uh, the KPIs and targets are set on, on capability. So what that means is, is I know that we can achieve this and I want to be scored good at my end year review. So this is what we're going to set as, as the KPI, something that we know is, is most likely achievable, maybe a little bit of a stretch, but still achievable. Uh, decisions are uh, based on like, you know, excessive reviews and, and leadership approvals. Uh, management is secretive. Uh, the workplace is non-visual and employees are seen as a resource. What we want to do in lean leadership is we want to move away from that. So we want to prevent fires and, and where we want to see fire um, prevention is actually rewarded. Uh, honestly, a lot of times the wrong people are being rewarded because it's the people that can't figure out why the fire keeps on uh, you know, going and happening. Uh, but because there's action, because they're seen as, hey, they're able to put it out each and every time, they're the ones that get promoted where the people that, hey, I don't like this fire. I'm going to make sure it doesn't come up again. That's that's not seen as action, even though there's a lot more action happening behind the scenes. So what we want to see is we want to be promoting people where they're actively going out and getting to the root cause and eliminating the fires in the first place. Uh, we want to have improvements identified by the front line where management then supports uh, them in making those improvements. Uh, we want to see problems as uh, improvement opportunities and make them visible. We don't want to hide problems. Uh, this is where we talk about it's it's important, you know, that we, we're not afraid to see red. You know, oftentimes people, um, they, they'll color things green to make it look like they're on, on task and that they're on target because they're afraid um, of the results of, of having something go red. What we want to see, because we want a visual workplace, is we want to see the red so that we can identify that, hey, there's an opportunity to improve. Let's go after it. Uh, we want to focus on the entire value stream versus uh, the individual silo. Uh, we want to go ahead and uh, take responsibility for our actions. We don't want to shift the blame. And more importantly, we want to examine and deep dive into the process for the failures versus focusing and blaming the individual. Um, in lean leadership, we want to focus the improvement efforts on flow efficiency, which is completely different than efficiency in, it, in and of itself, and effectiveness, in other words, doing the right things. And then we want to have our KPIs and our targets align with the customer requirements, not on what we think we can do, but actually what moves us to adding that value for the customer. And we want to have decisions based on data, observations, and those are closest to the work. Mint is transparent. They create a visual workplace. And most importantly, employees are seen as treasures because of that individual potential. And it's to that point that I really want to speak about today and helping you to understand what the situational leadership model is and how that can actually help you to become a better leader. So arguably, uh, W. Edwards Deming is the, uh, the father of lean, because uh, what he taught uh, the Japanese, especially at Toyota, uh, was picked up by Taiichi Ono and others. Uh, so I would, I would kind of argue that he's the, the father of lean from, from the perspective that we know it. And he said that the greatest waste in America is failure to use the abilities of people. So we want to shift that. We want to change that. We want to recognize people. We want to help them see the potential that they have within them and to help them to develop. And this is where I believe situational leadership helps us to do that. So we're going to do a quick little exercise. Um, if you can take out a, a pencil and a paper and you're going to four questions, nothing too serious, but I want to go ahead and get an idea about how you're, you're showing up and how you're thinking from your leadership perspective. So we're going to have three situations and we're going to go through those uh, now. So the first one, you've recently uh, trained a new uh, team member on how 
uh, to perform particular a particular task to which uh, they were initially meeting expectations. But over the last few weeks, their performance has uh, not been meeting the standard. So do you A, act quickly, emphasize the uh, use of uh, following standard operating procedures for achieving the objectives and deadlines, and then monitor the progress? Do you B, engage in friendly interaction, get their uh, feedback on improvement ideas, incorporate recommendations, and emphasize that um, objectives must be met? Do you C, encourage the team member to work on the problem and to be supportive of their efforts? Or do you D, avoid confrontation by not applying pressure? Uh, they know the standard and they'll figure it out. Okay, go ahead and mark A, B, or C, or D. Next, situation two. Your internal customers have uh, given you feedback uh, that your team members uh, have a poor attitude towards customer service. All of your team members have uh, three or more uh, years of experience and know their job, but they seem to uh, struggle with uh, more technical uh, questions and are um, unconcerned that the user complaints have increased. So do you A, set the goal for the uh, reduction of uh, customer complaints, give specific actions for the team members to take and monitor their progress to see that results are achieved? Do you B, present the data to the team and lead them in developing solutions, set performance expectations and follow up to ensure that actions are taken? Do you C, discuss specific uh, customer uh, complaints and participate with the uh, group in identifying solutions uh, to avoid getting uh, complaints in the first place? Encourage them to implement their ideas and then offer to uh, provide whatever support the team needs? Or do you D, provide the customer data and ask the team to solve the problem? All right, situation three. One of your uh, direct reports has participated in several Kaizen events and has been tasked to lead an improvement event. They have uh, visited IU multiple times over the past few weeks to discuss the project. Uh, the frequent uh, visits indicate to you that they lack confidence, but you've heard from a participant that the improvement is progressing nicely. So do you A, give your direct uh, report specific directions on how to manage the project? Do you B, provide specific suggestions and hints to help them uh, complete the project and then listen to their reactions? Do you C, listen to uh, your uh, direct uh, report's concerns, reassure them that they have the uh, experience necessary to handle the project, provide assistance uh, when, where, request, where requested, and uh, you're careful uh, not to make any decisions for them. Or D, do you tell your direct report uh, that they have this under control and reach out occasionally to see how things are going? Okay. And finally, situation four. One of your direct reports has a lot of experience, they consistently show up on time and uh, deliver outstanding results. Today, they showed up 45 minutes late and failed to notify you that they wouldn't make it to work on time. So, um, do you, A, I tell your direct report uh, that they're late, I restate the uh, rules and uh, create a monitoring plan to uh, stress the importance of being on time. Do you, B, have a friendly uh, discussion uh, with your uh, direct report about why they were late develop some uh, solutions uh, for them to implement to ensure on-time arrival so they won't be late in the future? Do you C, uh, tell them uh, that you are worried about them and uh, convince them of the importance of letting you know if they're running late, listen to their side of the story, and uh, make sure that they uh, understand your expectations? Or do you D, uh, let them know that you're happy they're okay, explain uh, that because they hadn't uh, called, you were concerned something might have happened to them, and you don't make a big deal uh, out of the incident. So go ahead on those four, mark your answer. And now, what is your leadership style? So if you chose A for any of those questions, that would be leadership style one. If you chose B, that would be leadership style two. If you chose uh, C, that would be leadership style three. And of course, D would be leadership style four. So if we open up the chat right now. Can you put, did you have one leadership style? Did you have two leadership styles? Did you put three leadership styles or four leadership styles? So one, two, three, or four. How many leadership styles did you show? Wow, look at all those answers coming in. That is amazing. Look at that. Wow. 520 is fantastic. We've got a, a good range. And looks like you guys are breaking uh, the mold. But traditionally, if you were to ask most leaders this, um, what they have is that most leaderships have a preferred style 
54% of you only have, you prefer one style. Now, I think because you guys are into lean, you understand the importance of that. You saw that there were some uh, different situations and scenarios, and so you chose some different answers. That's great. Um, 35 traditionally have two styles. 10% use only three styles. And then 1% of you use all four styles. What the idea of situational leadership is, is that you're going to adjust how you show up for your follower or followers based on where they're at. So let's go ahead and look at what does that actually look like? Because to be really effective and to really show um, this idea of respect for people, you have to be able to use all four styles. So let's uh, understand the model. All right. So it's based on this idea of a task and relationship behavior, um, and they're separated into a couple of dimensions. So from kind of an X, Y axis, X axis is about task behavior. This is very um, you know, high um, to low uh, in terms of how directive you need to be as a leader. On the Y axis, we have our relationship behavior. And so again, it's um, on the Y axis from you know, very high relationship where you're, you're doing a lot of support, a lot of uh, you know following up and, and coaxing and, and encouragement to very low where hey I just I just give the task I know you can do it and I don't need to invest a lot of uh, time into being supportive. So in essence, the situational leadership model is broken into four quadrants. So we have situation um, or style one, style two, style three, and style four. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Uh, kind of think of a horseshoe diagram. So starting in the bottom right-hand corner um, on the lower uh, x-axis or y-axis at the end of the x uh, to the right, we have what's known as style one, leadership or directing. Um, as we move up, we're going to be a little bit less uh, directive. Uh, so it's kind of more of coaching, which is what that uh, style two leadership is known as. Uh, in style three, where we're doing even less uh, directing behavior, it's known as participating. And finally, in style four, it's known as delegating. And we can also see this uh, relationship between uh, supportive and, um, and task behavior and being directive. So there's really these two leadership behavior that we are classifying things in, task and behavior uh, or relationship behaviors. So from a task behavior, this is really the extent to which the leader engages in spelling out the duties and responsibilities of the individual or the group. And from a relationship behavior, this is where you are as the leader engaging in two-way or multi-way communication and uh, you know spending time and energy with the individual or individuals. All right. So um, it might start off initially if somebody is, is first starting out, it's very directing, then you're starting to guide them. Eventually you're persuading them that, hey, you've got this, you can do it. There might be some explaining to help them move to the next level, helping them to problem solve. You're encouraging them that they, they've got it. They've got the skill set to, to be Supportive. You're going to want to monitor them. And finally, you're going to be observing them because really the, uh, the student becomes the, the teacher at this at this point. They, they know their stuff. All right. So how do you show up as a leader? Well, from a task perspective, you are going to really have to specify the goals people are accomplishing. You're going to, um, you know, organize the work uh, situations for the people. You're going to basically, you know, manage the capacity of what people are doing. Uh, you're setting timelines for people, you're providing uh, specific uh, directions, and you're uh, specifying uh, and requiring regular reporting on the progress. From a relationship side, what you're gonna be doing as a leader is you're providing a support and encouragement. You're involving people in kind of that give and take a discussion about work activities through communication. You're facilitating people's interactions with others. You're actively listening and um, so you're seeking out, you're listening to their, their opinions uh, and their concerns, and then you're acting on that. And then finally, you're providing feedback on people's accomplishments uh, or sometimes lack thereof, right? So with the four leadership styles, um, style one is really this idea of kind of high task. In other words, you're having to do a lot of direction, teaching them how to do things. And it's kind of low relationship in the sense that you're not um, spending a lot of energy into... Um, you know, in, investing in them, you're just kind of giving them the, the task, coming back, seeing how they're doing. It's, it's very transactional. Style two is now they have a little bit um, better knowledge. They know what they're doing, uh, but they, they need some encouragement. They need some help, uh, you know, coaching, taking them to the next level. 
So that's style two. Style three, they know what they're doing. You know that they know what they're doing, but they may kind of uh, be a little bit insecure about that. So this is where you're going to be helping them to uh, to move forward. And finally, um, style four is is where you're delegating it to them. They're subject matter experts, so it's it's both low task and low relationship, uh, and you're really monitoring and just making sure that uh, you're getting those regular updates. So what does this look like from a leadership uh, style? There's this secondary thing that we add, and it's it's known as kind of the follower readiness level or the development level of the followers. Um, and so there's you're matching where the follower is with where you need to be in terms of your leadership style and, and how you're you're responding. Uh, so it's sometimes known as like R1, R2, R3, R4, uh, or D1, D2, D3, D4, depending on which which uh, model that you're looking at. But sensibly, it's the same thing. You're trying to understand where is the follower in terms of their readiness or their development level for the task that you're assigning them. And so you may have somebody that is a subject matter expert, knows their stuff, and really you just kind of delegate it to them. Hey, you know they're going to do it. They report back to you. Everything's fine. But then you give them a task that they've never done before. They may, in that task, need a lot more help. And so they, you might have to change and be a lot more directive. This is what I need you to do. This is how you need to do it. Um, so if it's something they've never done before, you're going to start out. Now, the time that somebody stays in each one of these levels is going to vary. You may identify some transferable skills that they have and quickly move from directing to coaching. And then as they start to get the feel of, of the task of what they're doing, then you're participating with them. You're, you're giving them a little bit more encouragement. And finally, they, they understand what they're doing and they can do it on their own. And then you move into de delegating. So how long somebody stays in a, in a, a, uh, a quadrant is going to be dependent upon them. Um, hopefully, as you learn to adjust your leadership style, you can help them to progress a little bit quicker through each one of those models. And more importantly, you're going to pick the right style to show up and meet the people where they're at. Now, this is huge because what happens is oftentimes if you assume that somebody knows the task and you just give it to them, but they're really at kind of a development level one or two, and you're at, um, just delegating it to them and you're walking away, that's not going to feel good for them because they're going to feel like, you know, you didn't give them any direction. They didn't know what to do. They're going to be hesitant. The task may not get, you set them up for failure. On the other hand, if you take somebody who is a subject matter expert and knows what they're doing, but you're sitting there telling and spelling out everything that they need to do and when they need to do it. And why'd you send that email? You should have sent this email first. If you are doing that, you know, that is micromanaging. So there's a huge disconnect. So if you're, off by you know two or, or three styles from where the individual's at, it's going to create a lot of conflict. And eventually, the, it's going to drive the person out of the relationship or out of your, your department or out of your company or your organization. So it's, it's critical that we try to match and meet people where they're at, because that's going to feel a lot more comfortable. It's going to feel like you have um, you know, their needs in mind. And as a leader, you're showing up and meeting them where they're at. So that's that's really what we're going to be going over for the, the next few minutes here. So we talked about uh, this, the um, development uh, level of the followers, often known as um, the readiness level or the development. So I kind of think of this a little bit like uh, within Agile uh, and within uh, different forms of martial arts, they have this concept of Shu Hari. So Shu is this idea of of really it means uh, to per, uh, protect or to obey. It's it's teaching the fundamentals, the the techniques, the foundation of what you need to know. So in the case of karate, you would be going ahead and showing them this is how you punch, this is how you need to lock your arm, this is how your wrist needs to be so it doesn't get broken when you you strike. You're teaching all of these fundamentals and you keep on repeating them over and over again until it becomes second nature. And this is where we have in lean you know, things like standard operating procedures so that people know how to do it, what it should look like and, and how um, it should be. Now, eventually we move into ha. Ha is uh, in, in Japanese, it means self. It's this, this idea of you're starting to understand it for yourself. You're starting to uh, de uh, detach, I'm sorry, it means detach. You're detaching yourself, you're understanding, you know, the concepts, uh, but it also means uh, from like a no play or a gagaku uh, music uh, style. It's it's the middle 
act. It's the middle of the song. Um, so this is really kind of the middle of the journey. And then finally, Ri is the uh, the concept of uh, leaving or separating. It's it's where the student becomes the master. It's, it's where they have learned that, hey, uh, you know, for my body, for my my strength, my skills, kicking this way or, or moving this way, it, it allows me to have extra power or do something a little bit different. You've you've created and changed things to be able to um, to make it your own and to do it your way. Um, and so the same thing uh, holds true when we go into development levels. Within the development levels, um, the, the readiness levels, we, we see that uh, on the low end, beginner end, they're kind of unable and unwilling or they're insecure. Uh, moderate level, they're unable, willing, and they're confident. They think they can do this. Of course, as they know more, they realize they don't know as much as they thought they did. So it might kind of slip back. This is where there's a little bit of a dichotomy um, at that middle level, at that moderate level, where at um, level three or development level uh, three, they're able, but maybe they're a little unwilling or insecure because they realize how much they don't know and how much more there is to learn. And finally, when they have that confidence, they know what they're doing. Uh, they understand that, hey, things come up, but I can adjust. I can uh, meet it and figure it out. Uh, that's when you hit that development level four. So I hope that makes sense. So it's this idea of the shu, the ha, and the ri. It, it holds true within situational leadership. So what we want to do is we want to match our situational leadership with the follower's readiness level. And, and that's really where we, we gain the, the most um, you know, bang for the buck, as it were. So readiness is this idea uh, to extend the extent to which the follower demonstrates the ability and the willingness to accomplish the specific task. And um, of course, there's, there's two elements here, the ability and the willingness. So let's, let's define those. Ability is the knowledge, the experience, the skill that an individual or a group uh, brings to a particular task or activity. And willingness is the extent to which an individual or group has the confidence, the commitment, and the motivation to accomplish a specific task. So we have about um, you know, 10, 15 minutes left here. I'm going to go really quick through these things. Um, I've, I've left a lot of information here so that you can you can go back and refer to it. Uh, but the idea here is how do you identify the level of your follower. So the development level, again, at the very beginning, you're going to have somebody that really doesn't know the task. Um, they're unable or unwilling uh, to do it. So you might assign something that, that somebody's not used to doing, and so they're going to be unwilling. You might have somebody that's new to it. They might be actually, you know, kind of, you know, interested in doing the task and, and you know, motivated to do it, but they're unable. So, uh, but they're going to be, you know, a little bit insecure about it. So what you're going to see is, is certain, um, things that they're going to exhibit, right? They might be defensive or argumentative if, if they're not wanting to do the task. Um, on the other hand, if they are um, interested in doing the, uh, the tasks, you know, they might be concerned over the possible outcome. You know, they're going to have some confusion, unclear behavior, uh, fear of failure. What you're going to notice, and, and we'll really focus on these, these last things here, is um, they're they're not performing the task at the acceptable level because they're just learning. Uh, they're being intimidated by the task. They uh, might be unclear about the directions. They'll procrastinate or have a tendency to. Uh, they're not finishing the task. They're um, asking questions about the task. They're really avoiding or they're passing the buck and they're being defensive or uncomfortable at this stage. And so what we want to do is help them to gain that basic level of competence so they can do the task and they understand it. So what do we need to do as, as a leader? We're going to show up in a lot of ways. This is where we're going to you know, end up having to do a lot of you know, transactional uh, task related things with them. We're going to have to um, you know, recognize the, their enthusiasm or maybe help them see the transferable skills that they're bringing to the table and how those can relate to what they're doing. You have to set clear goals and, uh, and roles for them. You need to uh, make sure the standards uh, show them what those look like, uh, what a good job is create the timelines, the priorities, provide them the information and the data that they need in order to uh, be successful and help them understand what's going to be collected so they know how to perform. Uh, you're going to create action plans, have those specific directions about how, when, where, with whom, all of those things. You're going to have to um, create the boundaries and the limits. You're going to create uh, you know, the goals and the tasks um, from an organizational perspective of what they need to do. You're also maybe going to have to explain the unwritten rules of the culture about how things work around here. Uh, you're going to 
give them that step-by-step -step process uh, for learning the new skills, uh, hands-on training. You're going to show them and maybe kind of use, um, you know, a training within industry, a TWI um, framework for helping them to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. You're going to create um, examples of how others have accomplished the task the goal. And you're going to uh, create, create opportunities for them to practice, give them frequent uh, feedback, and you're going to help them with solutions to the problems. So these are the things that you have to do and demonstrate. As they move on and they get a little bit more confidence, they know what they're doing, you're going to notice uh, different uh, you know, frameworks about how they're showing up. And they might be you know, anxious uh, or excited. They uh, may be interested and responsive because, hey, I, I'm getting this. I understand this a little bit better. Uh, they're demonstrating a moderate ability. They're receptive to your input. They might be attentive, uh, even you know, enthusiastic. Uh, and even though it's kind of a new task and they don't have a lot of experience, they're, they're willing to take it on because they might have those transferable skills that we talked about. So again, how do we show up as their leader? Well, we need to make sure that they have clear goals, that um, we provide them the perspective, the frequent feedback, we praise uh, for making progress and that we're helping them to analyze the successes and the failures. Because after all, we wanna create a learning organization to help them and give them the assurance that it's okay to make mistakes. And that's, that's huge. I know one of the things that we do at the Port of Seattle is we will help people to um, you know, do a report out even if their improvement wasn't a success, uh, which, which is the first time we did it was you know, kind of a little bit strange. Like, why are you reporting out if what you did didn't work? And it's because we want people to understand that it's okay to make, um, you know, make mistakes. It's okay not to be successful. And so that's, that's what we're focusing on. And so we're going to give uh, explanations about um, why they're doing the tasks that goal. Uh, we're going to uh, pr uh, provide opportunities uh, to discuss the concerns, share any feelings they have. Uh, again, we're, we're starting to have more relationship involvement with them to help them to, to learn, and to, to grow uh, involvement and influence in the decision making. Uh, we're still, as the leader, we're, we're making a lot of the decisions at this point. Uh, we're giving them the encouragement the advice and uh, additional uh, next steps and alternatives. And we're, of course, coaching them and building and refining their skills. Now, as they move on and they have the skills, they know what they're doing, they're going to still, you know, they're going to demonstrate that they have that knowledge, that ability. They're, they may appear hesitant to finish or to take that next step. They may seem uh, scared, overwhelmed, or confused. Um, and they might seem uh, reluctant to perform alone uh, without that support that you've been giving them. Uh, and and uh, they might solicit frequent feedback, all signs that, uh, you know, they're kind of in this this development stage three or readiness level three. Um, so how do we show up for them? Well, this is where we have to be an approachable mentor or coach, depending on, you know, how much uh, help or support or encouragement they need. Uh, we need to give them opportunities to test their ideas, to, to make those successes or failures. Uh, we have to uh, create opportunities uh, to express concerns and have them share their feelings with us. Uh, we want to support and encourage uh, them to develop uh, self-reliant problem-solving skills. Right? We, want, we don't want to, as leaders, be the sole problem solver for our group. We want our group to be uh, you know, self-reliant problem solvers themselves um, so that we all share that responsibility and we can uh, make these constant improvements, Right, really embrace the spirit of Kaizen or continuous improvement. Next, we want to uh, help in uh, looking at uh, the experience and the skills objectively so that they have that confidence that's being built. And again, praise and recognition, can't say this enough, it's really critical and important uh, that we uh, acknowledge when people are successful. Um, and then of course, we want to uh, create um, obstacles, or we want to remove rather obstacles uh, to the goals uh, so that they can, they can uh, be successful in what they're doing as part of our responsibility as, as a leader. Uh, and then finally, we want to. Um, sometimes we might have to kickstart them uh, to overcome that procrastination that might happen because they're hesitant about their skills, even though we know that they're capable of doing it. Now, finally, um, development level four. These these are really the, the individuals that are um, subject matter experts. They know their stuff. In fact, they may even know it better than you. So they're going to keep their boss informed of the task and progress. Uh, they can operate autonomously. Uh, they're very results oriented. Uh, they share both the good and the bad news, which is, is critical. Uh, they make um, effective decisions regarding tasks. They perform at high standards, and they're aware of their expertise. So 
how do we show up for them? Well, again, we want to give them variety. We want to give them challenges. We want to give them opportunity to grow and expand um, and maybe even move up to that next level where, where they're, you know, a colleague at the same level as us. So we're, we're helping them to get those skills and those things that they need to continue to move on in their, their leadership journey. Um, often these are the individuals too, at this development level uh, for that other people look to as a leader. They may not have the title of leader, but because they know their stuff, people come to them for advice and uh, for uh, clarification on things. So a leader is also at this point is really more of a mentor or even a colleague, uh, right? They acknowledge their contributions, they're autonomous, uh, and they give them the authority and the trust. And they, again, uh, help them with the opportunity to share that knowledge and skills with others. Uh, including maybe even yourself, because at this point, uh, you know, you may actually learn some things from them. So it's it's a great opportunity as a leader to uh, realize that, you know, you have opportunity for, for learning as well. Uh, so there's a, a quote that I love, which is, uh, let's go here. Uh, the, uh, the person's life is an accumulation of time. Uh, employees provide their uh, precious hours of life to the company. We have to use it effectively. Otherwise, we are wasting their life. So this is from A.G. Toyota. He was the president of uh, the Toyota Motor uh, Corporation from 1970 or 67 uh, to 1981. Uh, I really like this this quote because it shows us, uh, you know, that we have to be concerned about our um, people that we work with, that we're helping them to be successful. Uh, because if we're not, if we're not giving them those opportunities. Uh, then we're really wasting their, their life because we do spend a lot of time at work and we want them to be successful in everything they do. So using situational leadership model, there's really kind of three steps here. It's um, first, we want to identify the uh, most important task or priorities uh, for um, our followers. We want to uh, diagnose the readiness level of the follower, and then we want to adjust our style to meet, match them where they're at. So that is is really critical. So how do we do this? Well, for step one, we want to help them understand the Hoshin Kanri, the strategic vision of the organization and the goals and how their task aligns with what they're doing. So how does what they're doing align with you know, the greater vision of what we're doing as an organization, as well as how does that help provide value to the end user, the customer? We want to go to the Gimba. We want to understand what's happening at the work and we want to track um, their performance through KPIs. So developing and challenging your people is really the work of a lean leader. This helps you get there. Next, we want to go ahead and understand where they're at and diagnose that so that we can um, move forward. And there's a lot of ways that you can do this, but we want to look at their competency and their commitment. And from a competency standpoint, we're looking at the tasks, the knowledge, and the skills, and any transferable skills that they bring to the table. Likewise, we want to go ahead and look at their commitment. How motivated are they? And how, how's their confidence with doing the task? That's going to help us to identify where they're at. So we want to really show respect for people. And skills matrix can even help us to uh, make some of these identifications. Finally, we want to decide on matching our leadership style. So this is really what a lean leader is all about. It's, it's making sure that we're aligning what they're capable of doing with how we're showing up and, and managing the task. Um, and really, the, we get this through the skills matrix, we get this through open communication, and through one-on-ones. Even explaining this model to your followers can be useful because they can say, hey, you know what? You're, you're showing up as a four, and, and really, I kind of feel like I'm a two, right? Uh, there's a disconnect here. Or, or likewise, hey, I feel like I'm a three, maybe even you know, moving into a four, but you're treating me like a one. Um, so having having these conversations, you know, can really be helpful at making sure that you can adjust and meet people where they're at. So we want to select those appropriate styles. Um, again, I, I've I've got this for you uh, to to look at, but with time, I do want to get some to some questions. Here's something that I do want to focus on: effective at a level one, as you're showing up for that leadership style one, it is directing, it is telling, it's guiding, it's directing, it's establishing. What is not effective is demanding, demeaning, demoting, attacking, yelling. That does not help, right? So we want to go ahead and we want to meet them where they're at. We want to show up as a leader and um, really help them to understand what it is that they're doing so they can be successful. At a level two, uh, what is effective is is kind of maybe selling. Hey, I know you can do this. Let, let, let's work together. We, you're, you're really getting it. Uh, it's coaching. It's explaining. It's clarifying. It's persuading. 
However, it is not rationalizing, it's not manipulating, it is not preaching or defending um, your actions or, or even you know, what's happening. So uh, at a level three where they have the skills, they know what they're doing, but they may be a little bit hesitant to move on. Effective is participating with them. It's encouraging them, it's supporting them, it's empowering them, it's giving them that confidence and showing that you have that trust in them so they can move forward. But not effective is gonna be patronizing them, placating them, condes being condescending or pacifying. You want to show up and, and meet them where they're at, treat them like individuals, right? And finally, at level four, this is where the individual knows what they're doing and it's it's known for delegating because really this is the ultimate thing. If we could get all of our people to a level four and we just delegate, man, your job is gonna be so easy. Um, but effective would be delegating, observing, entrusting, assigning, maybe even clarifying every once in a while. But uh, what is not gonna be effective is abandoning, dumping, avoiding, or withdrawing from them. Um, they may still need you. They may still wanna you know, get feedback from you, but you can't just leave them alone, right? That's 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 really not what delegating is. Uh, so just just be aware of that. So that's the model, uh, and then the three skills that we need to sh um, you know show up uh, with with this model is is really this idea of you know diagnosing, having a flexibility, and uh, meeting them where they're at, and then partnering with them for performance. So I hope this makes sense to you. Let's quickly um, turn it into applying the model with Lean. So here is the PDCA uh, framework. Um, I like this model because it shows that we're gonna spend a lot more time in planning uh, than we do in the other phases because we're gonna be more effective as we spend more time planning. Now, this is a, a concept um, of applying the situational leadership model with the PDCA framework. And this came from Sam McPherson with the Lean Leadership Academy. Check him out on LinkedIn. He's he's uh, fantastic, has a lot of great uh, knowledge and skills and, and does a lot of uh, workshops to help people to not only embrace this, but also understand things like Hoshin Kanri, uh, Obeya, things like that. Uh, so you're probably familiar with this. The one thing you might not notice or might not be familiar with is the GTS or the grasp the situation that's in the center of the uh, the PDCA cycle. This is the idea that um, as you're going through the cycle, you really need to always be understanding where are people showing up at, how are the, uh, you know, through voice of the customer, how are your uh, customers feeling about the activities and what you're doing. So this is where we're measuring, quantifying, we're creating the, uh, the KPIs uh, to track our performance um, throughout the entire uh, duration of what we're doing. So in grasp the situation, we want to align uh, the work and the vision, right? align the Hoshin Conry, the ideal target state of what we're trying to do as, a, as an organization and that vision, of the company or, or the, um, the government agency that we work for and apply that to um, the task and the work so they understand and see how that moves them forward. We want to align the work uh, with the skills. Um, and we also then want to make sure that we're diagnosing uh, properly their readiness level, um, their development level. In the planning phase, we're going to help our people to grow. We're going to set them up for success. We're going to set some goals and expectations for them. We're going to partner for their performance, and we're going to follow up um, and create a follow-up plan so that they know what to expect. And then we're going to assign that work in the do phase. We're going to explain the process. We're going to match their um, our leadership style with where they're at. We're going to build that mutual trust and respect because we're treating them as individuals and we're showing up uh, where they're at. We're gonna provide the encouragement that they need and we're gonna provide the right support. The checking is really where we're going to Gimba. We're going to where the action takes place. We're directly observing what they're doing to make sure that um, things are working. We're gonna evaluate them, help them identify any root cause issues, maybe even look at and identify root cause issues that we can come back and um, work with, remove those obstacles, those roadblocks. We're gonna focus on the standards and we're gonna provide the space that they need uh, for the growth. And finally, we're going to act and adjust. We're going to provide feedback so they can learn and so we can learn by reflecting on our own leadership. Did we correctly identify the, you know, the situation where they're at with the leadership style that we were using? Sometimes we don't get it right, and that's okay, as long as we're continuing to adjust. Finally, we have, um, you know, we're evaluating that readiness level for the next work that we're going to assign or the next challenge. And we're, we're continuing to help them to grow and to, uh, to move forward. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and go into uh, Q and A. If there are any questions, yeah, Jared, there's some great questions in the Q and A. Cool. Um, one is, 
as a leader, I think we strive for our staff to be D4s, but it can be a very vulnerable feeling for a leader to acknowledge that those staff may be stronger in some areas than the leader themselves. What are your thoughts on how leaders can be open to this and get beyond their own insecurities to uplift the strengths of their D4s, even if it risks making the leader look weaker in some areas? Yeah. Um, again, this, this goes back to the, the slide where I showed, you know, on, on the one side, you've, you've got, um, you know, that traditional leadership. On the other side, you have lean leadership. It, it may be. Um, you know, that, that somebody is better performer than you. And it could be that that person ends up being, you know, your boss. Um, you know, not necessarily a good feeling. I mean, that, that's where you're you're going to want to continue to develop and, and you know, um, build yourself and learn. And you can learn from people. So don't don't think that, you know, I have nothing to learn. I'm the boss. And and if, if you have that, that level and that hierarchy, you're really missing the point of what respect for people is about. So, um, you know, not, not coming down on you, but there, there is the opportunity to, to learn and to grow uh, from individuals. Um, one thing that we do need to be careful of, and as, as the question was coming out, it did remind me of something. We have a tendency as leaders to know so-and-so does a really great job. They, they, they perform outstanding. And so we assign work to that individual. Now that individual sees it maybe as a punishment. It's like, why do I get all this work? Why, why aren't they assigning it and you know, giving the capacity to other people? I'm overwhelmed. I have all this, this work. So if we tend to rely on one person and we don't spread the work and we don't spread what we're doing and help other people to develop and to learn those same skills, even though they may not be as good at it, then we're really missing a big opportunity um, as a leader and actually kind of shooting ourselves in the foot because we might drive somebody away, even though they're fully capable because they feel overwhelmed. So that, that's really where it is important as, as a situational leadership model to understand that and be able to like, what can I do? What tasks can I assign to move the person to that next level in their development cycle? If that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And we kind of have a question here that takes it from the opposite direction. What about when new hires think they know everything, but really they do not because the new context requires totally different work? They can feel insulted when redirection is required. How do you handle this mismatch of leader style needed in your mind versus what the follower thinks they need? Yeah, well, this is where open communication comes in, right? So you need to, um, you know, explain, maybe help them see where there, there's a mismatch. Now, it's, it's going to come out. One of the things that we are trying to do is allow people to problem solve for themselves. So coming with with the knowledge and the resources and things that they have in the past and saying, Hey, I saw this work this way. It's okay to allow people. And, and really this is what we want. We want people to fail because then they might be coachable or teachable. I'll give you a good example. Um, years and years ago, a boy scout camp. Um, there was a kid, he was learning, he was earning his uh, uh, cooking merit badge and he proceeded to do what they told him to do, right? He's following the standard operating procedures, but the pancake uh, batter that he was mixing up was like thick and it had these big chunks of, of flour that hadn't been broken up that were like still, you know, uh, dry. Um, and I suggested, Hey, you need to put a little bit more water into this. And he got upset at me and told me, I didn't know what I was talking about. And I followed directions and just, you know, I'm like, okay. And then I said, Hey, um, you may want to like kill the fire down because you've got the fire coming up over the pan. It's going to burn. No, you don't know what you're talking about. This is how they told me how to do it. I'm like, okay. So he proceeds to make these uh, pancakes and the moment he poured it on, it turned instantly black because the pan was too hot. The, the top layer started sliding off. He flipped it over and then it's like sliding off the other way. He's putting on the thing. So it was like literally cold and wet in the inside, black on both sides, chunks of, uh, you know, dry powder on the inside of it. It was just nasty. Um, and so everybody was like just putting a ton of maple syrup to try to even make it edible. Not good. Um, and then when there was enough for one pancake, uh, you know, left, I said, hey, do you mind if I try? And he's like, sure, you can't do any better. I'm like, okay. So I kill down the fire. I go ahead. I raise the uh, the pan up. I give it some time to, you know, cool down. I uh, cook some bacon on it to create some grease uh, so that it, it wouldn't stick to the pan. I add uh, enough water to create three pancakes. And I proceed to make three golden brown pancakes. And one, everybody was was jealous that I was eating those. But two, 
it made him teachable. So sometimes we have to allow somebody to fail so they can learn, and then we can go ahead and, and teach and instruct. Um, but that, that's where communication, you know, comes in. Say, hey, that may be something that we, we want to try, but what I would like you to do is, is follow the standard operating procedure so you see how it works first, and then we can move from there. It, because there may be some opportunity for improvement. And, uh, you know, I'm not opposed to that. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of give and take, but also creating an opportunity for people to fail as long as it doesn't impact the health and safety um, of, of an individual, then I think that's, that's a fair thing to do. Great example. Love it. Um, we have one other question I really want to get to. Um, what advice do you have for a leader who has a team at multiple readiness levels? What is the best way to meet the needs of each team member when time is constrained? Yeah. Um, that's a good one. Uh, so in that case, I guess the bell curve is probably where you're going to end up by, you know, coming out. You, you may have some that are going to be on, on the, just, you know, delegate it to them and make them, you know, just, just have them go with it. You're going to have others that you're going to have to, you know, step by step. Um, it, so what you would end up doing is is maybe working somewhere between a, a two and a three, um, a little bit of both. You might end up taking some individuals aside or making sure that they're assigned, you know, just a very specific amount of work uh, that can support everyone else. And you're spending most of your time helping that individual while the rest of the team moves forward. You could even assign somebody that's at a level four to work backwards and and help support uh, some of the other individuals that are at a, you know, a three or a two. Um, or even back at a, at a one, hey, can you work with this individual? I'll work with these. Um, so sometimes dividing it up so you can divide and conquer is, is a good way to do it. Uh, again, depends on the situation and what you're doing, but um, really trying to to meet people where they're at. And you know, in some cases, there is no really great answer, but uh, trying to uh, come to that happy medium is probably the way I would handle that. Thank you so much. We've got a lot of praise for you in this q and A. I I just want to read um, out some of them. Cheryl D'Angelo Gary says, thank you for the examples of effective versus ineffective behavior. That was a brilliant inclusion. Very helpful. Sean Williams says, what a great presentation. I learned a lot from this framework. Is there any additional information or a book to learn more about this topic? Um, and Anna says, this presentation was mind-blowing and so timely. One of the best I've ever listened to. You explained everything so well and gave so many examples. Thank you so much. And more. So I just want to thank you, Jared, for your presentation today. We had over 500 attendees. It really hit home for a lot of people exactly what they needed to hear. And I want to thank everybody who attended today. And... Uh, there's still a lot more conference to come and you're still able to register for that um, uh, if you wanna attend more sessions. So I also just wanna give another shout out to our ASL interpreter, Kelly, and our CART uh, captioner, Bridget. And I want to let you know that you can go back, rewatch these sessions again when we get them uploaded to our website. Um, you can download copies of the materials. They're already uploaded to our website, so you can get this presentation there, and you can sign up for additional sessions. It was, this was really great, Jared. Thank you so much, and thank you to everybody who attended. Thanks for having me.